When it comes to data transformation, one of the most common tools nowadays is DBT. But one of the arguments against using these code based tools is that you could instead just write store procedures or ad hoc queries directly in the database. And while technically this is possible to me, that misses some of the biggest benefits of using these tools in the first place. And so in this video, what I want to talk about are some of the main differences between using code based tools, like for example, DBT and strictly writing store procedures in the database. And in particular, we'll talk about their differences in functionality, maintainability and governance. And I know those are kind of buzzwordy terms, but they're important. So let's talk about them. All right, so getting started, let's talk about the differences in just core functionality, how these things are used. And we'll start first with just explaining store procedures. If you're familiar with that, you might be able to skip through this. Store procedures are exactly what they sound like. They're saved, they're stored procedures of code. So you can write scripts to do things like insert data, create tables, update, tables, delete records, all these different things in a stored and repeatable fashion. So you have a file in the database that you can update. And this is a common approach for handling data transformation because you can trigger these different procedures to run at different times. So for example, one of the first companies I worked at, we just had a bunch of stored procedures that we would trigger every morning, say six o'clock in the morning, and they would run and update all the tables and get everything ready to go for the day. A lot of times what you'll see too is that they can be nested. So one store procedure might call another store procedure within it, and you can actually trigger them to run and execute these statements, whether by a built in SQL agent job. So maybe something on the database that can run on a schedule, or you can use any other tool, maybe from Microsoft, it's SSIS, or maybe use Informatica, or you just use Airflow or something to just trigger these jobs to run. Now on the other side, let's talk about what these code based data transformation tools are all about. And in this example, we're going to talk mostly about dbt It's the one I'm most familiar with. It's the most common one but there are other ones out there that do similar things. But regardless of which tool you use, what we're talking about here is a separate code based project that lives outside of the database. So we talked about store procedures, they function within the database. This we're writing queries and we're writing files and code in a separate project. Oftentimes it's version controlled through a platform like GitHub or GitLab. So tactically you are building this in files and directories in a project, not technically within the database like you would a store procedure. And the way I think about this is while a store procedure has code in the database, it's there and it runs. Tools like dbt in my mind function more like really advanced compilers. That's really generalizing what it does. There's so many more features, but at the end of the day, what it does is it has a lot of things that create scripts that get sent to the database to ultimately run. So it is a little bit of a different approach Approach, but it's important to understand dbt itself isn't in the database. It's using a connection to go to your database and then run the code that you're telling it to it can really make it extremely dynamic and modular in the idea that you can set a configuration in one place and it's going to apply to a bunch of stuff all at once because it's built with that in mind. And that's a big difference. It's designed purposely to solve a lot of problems that in a store procedure world, you would do a bunch of different times and maybe you have to update things in a bunch of different places. If you build your dbt project right, you can handle that all in a more centralized location. On that topic, it comes built in with what's called Jinja, which is a templating functionality. So if you've ever built a lot of store procedures, you know that there's a lot of things that you redo a lot of times, or maybe there's some advanced types of SQL that you're trying to think about how to generate and how to write it. Jinja allows you to compile things in really unique ways to handle a lot of these edge cases and complex situations. I would say the comparison in a typical database might be a user defined function, but with Jinja, there's a lot more than just function type code that's more of compiling things. And this is another part where it's really important to understand that with dbt, you're compiling code first before it runs. Therefore, you're able to use things like Jinja to compile it in really unique ways that if it was just pure SQL, it might not be as smooth. The other thing to mention is that dbt ultimately is a Python project and you execute it through the command line. So you can run it as a bash command, really anywhere you can write commands. So this offers a lot of flexibility in terms of automation. You don't have to have the full database set up to run the code. It just allows you to do a lot more creative things with how you execute this code, the automations, all of these different things. Whether you're using store procedures or dbt, ultimately you're probably trying to create some sort of data model within your project. And while data modeling is absolutely one of the most important things to focus on while building a data architecture, there are other components that you need to be aware of. So whether you're looking to implement this as a leader yourself, or you just want to level up your skills individually to help you a little bit more, I put together a completely free modern data checklist, which breaks down the four most important components of any data architecture, along with some helpful links and descriptions of things to consider as you go about building that for yourself. So if you're interested, there'll be a link in the description and the first comment below. But with that said, let's now get back to this video. So now let's talk about the differences in maintainability. And this is a big 
big one because data and code, it gets messy. At some point, things will grow and become difficult to maintain, whether you're growing your team and you have more people interacting on the team or you have more logic, more requests, whatever it is, at some point it gets hard. And so how you address that is really important. And that's probably one of the biggest benefits to me of these code-based tools like DBT because it is designed with the workflow in mind. And in fact, the developer workflow is one of the main reasons DBT was created in the first place. So with that backdrop, let's talk about how you maintain your projects and your code in these two different approaches. So with the stored procedure, like we mentioned, you're building it and executing everything directly in the database. You're effectively saving directly to the live code. And with that, it makes version controlling and tracking changes historically a little bit difficult. There are ways you could work with this and perhaps things have gotten a little bit better since the days that I've worked on it. But generally speaking, it's directly saved to the database, which might mean production. And a lot of times the only way teams will track what changed in the code is by keeping a log manually at the top of the procedure. So there'll be a big commented out section with dates and names and a little description of what were the changes historically, whoever touched the code last. And a lot of that really is relying on people to do that in the first place. Not everybody remembers to do that. It also doesn't really show you the specific lines of code that were changed. It's just a general blanket statement of this was changed here and this is what happened. It does give some context, but it's nowhere near the functionality of having a fully version controlled project. As a result of that, it becomes fairly difficult to maintain this long-term because people are constantly coming in and out of that. They're making tweaks. Maybe they need to address a bug. It just moves quick and eventually people miss things or make mistakes and it's hard to track. The versioning just isn't as clean as it could be with a version control platform behind it. DBT is designed along with these other tools with this idea of version control in mind. It's purposely built to address this known gap in the workflow. Instead of saving right to the live sort procedure code or trying to go through the database, instead you're able to do things like create branches in a version control platform, test it in locally, create different environments, having specific processes for how you move your code along with pull requests, with documentation, it provides a lot more visibility in general of who changed what and some of the context around it as opposed to, again, just a comment within the code itself. The other aspect of this maintainability concept is that with DT, your project is split between SQL files, which is the typical SQL code, the select statements and everything, as well as YAML files, which focus mostly on the configurations and structure and metadata of the project. And by separating that, it allows each file to be focused on something specific. And you can introduce nice folder structures within your project so it's easier to understand, easier to follow, and ultimately easier for other people to work with. It's a separate Python-based project. You can do a lot more with it as opposed to strictly SQL. So you can add other things to the project like linters, like automated code checks, all sorts of stuff to review your project to make sure things follow the right standards all before it ever gets to production. So there's so many more steps which improve the ability to maintain it and have a well-structured project as opposed to just doing it directly in a stored procedure. Now, the last thing here is governance and quality control. And while we've already talked about some of this, I do just want to mention, again, some of these differences on this topic. With store procedures, because they are specifically in the database and they are one-off objects there, if you want to do testing, you typically have to do that manually or create some other separate procedure or function or something to test it on your behalf. And you have to know to trigger those and put that together. So for example, maybe you have a specific set of SQL scripts that you want to run against the data to make sure that it's meeting certain conditions, that you don't have duplicate values or something like that. That. You can also manage this through database constraints. So making sure that the database itself will check that a certain column can't be null or that it has to be unique if it's a primary key. It's important to know that some of the more modern cloud databases do not enforce some of these constraints. So depending on which one you're using, you need to make sure that if you are going to build that in more of a stored procedure type approach that you know what you're dealing with in terms of the database functionality itself. So while you can manage this stuff as a team and have certain conventions that you want to follow, a lot of it's going to come down to individual discipline as opposed to there being some sort of systematic or built in process for how this gets done or documented and overall just built within this workflow. So now let's talk about this same concept with DBT or other tools that you might be using that are similar. It allows you to build your documentation within the project. You don't have to hop around different things, but it also takes that information and lets you spin it up into a pre-built website, which is really great for transparency and letting everybody know exactly what's going on. In the past, that's not really possible. Again, everything's just hidden directly in the code or maybe in a completely separate wiki somewhere else. It also has testing built in with just a few lines. You can add checks for uniqueness, not null, 
relationships, accepted values, or create your own custom tests that you can manage within the project and add around. So it's really this overall idea of having a systematic and procedural approach to managing a data transformation project. A lot of these things are problems that you would have run into manually in the past with stored procedures, with writing pure SQL, but it's now been put together and packaged into a separate tool that looks to solve these problems. And I want to finish here by mentioning that tools like dbt, while they're really great, it's not going to solve all of your problems just by using it alone. If you have poor logic or poor naming conventions or no organization and are sloppy with things, it's not going to help you with that. In fact, it's probably just going to get more messy. I think it's important to maintain that perspective because if you're going to use these kind of tools, you need to make sure you're using it with the right intention and are strategic with how you implement it, how you build it within the whole ecosystem of your data architecture. If you do that, it can be a significant improvement to your whole data process. But again, a lot of that is up to you and your team to make sure you are using it right. Otherwise, you may not recognize a lot of these benefits that we're talking about here. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of some of the differences between stored procedures and DBT in terms of the core functionality, maintainability, and overall governance and testing with a project. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you at the next video.